Okay, well, good evening. Oh, we've got, we've got more people here tonight than we had this afternoon. Okay, well, it's good to, good to see everyone and uh, good to be with you. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, I'm sure some of you probably will not be able to be here tomorrow morning. So uh, in case that is the case, let me tell you how very, very much I've enjoyed being with you today. Uh, yes, last night and today. I really have. I've enjoyed talking with many of you, and I appreciate the encouragement that many of you have given me. And um, my wife, Kathy, emailed me, and uh, let's see, when was that? This Last night, last night this morning. But anyway, she emailed me and, and asked if there was any fruit being born, you know, on, on my trip. And I, I told her, indeed, by God's grace, there has been. And uh, I'm very, very grateful for that. And um, I thank you for the encouragement, the, the gracious way in which you have received me. And uh, I, I tell people that one of the joys that has been mine, a blessing that has been mine as I've traveled around the world preaching is that it, it does not matter where I am, uh, completely different country, and I've been on every continent except Antarctica. I haven't preached in Antarctica yet, but I've been every other continent and it doesn't matter where I go, um, no matter where I am, no matter what language is spoken, no matter what culture you know, I, I may find myself in, when, when I'm with like-minded believers, there's a, a fellowship and a kindred spirit there that transcends all of these superficial differences and it, it really is a precious thing to experience. Uh, if you've uh, traveled abroad, uh, I hope that you've had that blessing as well to, to have fellowship with people from um, a different tongue, tribe, and nation. But God does indeed have his people from everywhere. I mean, every tongue, every tribe, every nation uh, will be in heaven. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to have that fellowship with, with like-minded believers from different parts of the world. It, it truly, truly is. I look forward to heaven. I look forward to heaven. Uh, let's, let's, let's ask the Lord's blessings on our time together, and then we'll start. Father, I do thank you for this time. I thank you for the privilege that has been mine to come to Norway and to preach your word. And I thank you for all these who have gathered. Um, I thank you for the desire for truth that, uh, th that you have instilled in their hearts and in mine. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would again guide us into your truth, that you would sanctify us in the truth of your word and that we would come to know you better and, and, and be more uh, equipped Christians, be obedient Christians, that we would live lives that glorify you. May we not shy away from your truth. May we not fear man. Uh, may we fear only you. And um, Lord, we thank you for your love and your provision for us. These things we ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, this session is entitled, The Hurt of Healing. Tonight, we will be looking at physical healing. Is it always God's will to be healed? If I'm not healed, is it because I don't have enough faith? Uh, is healing provided for in the atonement? We'll be looking at all of those issues tonight. So, let's begin. Physical healing. Is it always God's will? Of course, the prosperity preachers say, Yes, it is. Benny Hinn says this, the world's most famous faith healer. He says, he promises to heal all, everyone, any whatsoever, everything, all our diseases. That means not even a headache, sinus problem, not even a toothache, nothing. No sickness should come your way. God heals all your diseases. Joseph Prince says this in his book, Destined to Reign. He says, you are destined to reign in life. You are called by God to be a success, to enjoy wealth, to enjoy health, to enjoy a life of victory. When you reign in life, you reign over sin, over poverty, over every curse, and over every sickness and disease. The faith preachers make no bones about it. You should never be sick. Or if you do get sick, physical healing is guaranteed provided that you have enough faith. Watch this video clip from Gloria Copeland.
You could take that one psalm right there and you could do away with the tradition that says, Lord, if it be thy will, heal him. Don't even bother to pray for me if you're going to pray that. If you don't know enough about the Word of God to know it's God's will to heal, you can't pray the prayer of faith. And so you might as well just stay home. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say that mercy is not her predominant spiritual gift. If you're sick, it is your fault. Uh, watch this from her husband, Kenneth Copeland. Well, I don't understand why God healed them and he won't heal me. Could it be? By some stretch of the imagination. Oh, probably not, but could it be? <laughs> that is your fault, not God's. <laughs> oh, yeah. Say it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, again, friends, if, if, if you begin with the premise, if you begin with the premise that it is always God's will to be healed, and a person prays for that healing for days, weeks, months, years, some people for decades, but the healing does not come, then the question must be asked, whose fault is it? And by definition, it cannot be God's fault because he's perfect. So the only other one to whom to look is the one who is sick. It's his fault, it's her fault, because he doesn't have enough faith, has some unconfessed sin, in his or her life, maybe hasn't given enough money to the ministry, hasn't sown a big enough seed yet, or maybe that person's not even saved. But there can be no other conclusion which one can draw. The fault always lies squarely at the foot of the one who is sick. This clip from Jan Crouch. Now, Jan Crouch is the wife or now widow of Paul Crouch, the presidents of TBN, founders and presidents of TBN. Jan Crouch claims that uh, she was healed of cancer back in 2003. In reality, Jan Crouch had treatment for her cancer and surgery for it, but she says that Jesus healed her. And she says that one day after her healing, she was thanking Jesus for healing her, and Jesus spoke to Jan, and he had a very interesting response to Jan Crouch. Watch this. One day I was in my prayer garden and I was just thanking him. I just said, Jesus, I, I just thank you. I just thank you that you are the greatest healer. You are the greatest everything. And I thank you, thank you, thank you. And he said to me, no, Jan, thank you for receiving my gift. Now I know it's a little bit difficult to take anything seriously that comes from someone who looks like that. <laughs> you were all thinking it, you know you were. <laughs> but aside from that, dear friends, the very notion that Jesus would thank her for anything. Friends, Jesus owes us nothing. We owe him everything. And for someone to actually teach that Jesus thanked her or him or whoever cannot come from someone who knows the Jesus of the Bible. She may know a Jesus that she has created after her own image, but she does not know the Jesus of the Bible. So, the question is really, is there any biblical support that it is always God's will for a person to be healed? Are there any proof texts to which they would appeal? There are a few, and I'd like us to look at a couple of the more uh, popular ones. Don't have time to look at all of them, but uh, I want us to look at a couple. One of them, amazingly enough, is Ephesians 
5.23, this is what Benny Hinn says about Ephesians. 5.23, Benny Hinn writes, And now the Bible says in Ephesians 5.23 that Jesus Christ is a Savior of the body. He is not only the Savior of the soul, He is the Savior of the body. Ladies and gentlemen, you can cry out, You are the Savior of my body, Lord Jesus. You are the Savior of my soul. If Jesus Christ is a Savior of the body, then your body ought to be made whole. Now that sounds logical, doesn't it? It does. That is, un until you actually read Ephesians 5.23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. One need not be a Greek scholar to know that the body in Ephesians 5.23 is not talking about your flesh and blood body. It's talking about the church. In this kind of Mickey Mouse hermeneutics Bible interpretation would be laughable, comical, if it weren't that it were leading so many people astray. Another one of their proof texts, now this is one of their favorites. This is like the gold standard of the prosperity gospel. 3 John 2. 3 John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in good health, even as thy soul prospers. Watch this from Joyce Meyer. 3 John 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you might prosper in every way, and that your body might keep well, even as I know your soul prospers and keeps well. Now that's a very wonderful scripture. I pray that you would prosper in every way. So he talks about prosperity. He says, I would that you prosper and be in health. And be in health. So we see right there that... God wants us to be healthy. Can everybody say, God wants me to be healthy? Well, you can say it all day long, but that's not what this verse is talking about. John is writing a letter to his friend Gaius. You would see Gaius' name in the first verse of this short little book of 3 John. And John opens his letter in much the same way that you and I would open a letter or an email, as the case is nowadays, that we write to one of our friends. And basically, John is saying this. He's saying, Dear Gaius, I hope that this finds you doing well. Friends, that's all he's saying. This is not a doctrinal statement. This is not a, a, a blanket statement promising physical healing or prosperity. Not at all. Uh, he was writing a letter, and it's a common greeting to a letter. Nothing more and no, nothing less. And the prosperity preachers know it but they don't want you to know it because it just happens to fit their theology. Watch this from Joseph Prince. Joseph Prince says that the Bible says that we can bind and loose things. And so if you don't like sickness, well, you just bind it. Are you all ready for God's Word? Let's go right into God's word. Remember that healing is provided for us. But until you get mad, you know, you say that, no, I, I'm not going to allow the devil to, all right? Don't forget what Jesus said. Jesus says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. In the rabbinical uh, teaching, all right, in the rabbinical idea, the rabbis tell us that, that uh, even the rabbis, they are given keys where they, they permit some things to happen. And they don't permit some things to happen. Well, Jesus has, has even greater keys, amen, the key of David. And the thing is that that word there doesn't say what God binds, what God disallow. All right? Then it will be disallowed on earth. No, God says what you prohibit, what you bind, what you disallow, I will disallow in heaven. Whatever you allow, I will allow in heaven. So those that believe in the doctrine, all right, God wants some of us sick and all that. Usually it's not them, it's others. It's not their family, it's always others. Those who believe that God wants some of us sick, they never include themselves. So, uh, Joseph Prince, I hope that video doesn't start again, but Joseph Prince says, so, so based on um, binding and loosing that we see in Matthew chapter 18, whatever you bind on earth, he says, 
will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So therefore, if you don't like sickness, then you just bind it. He doesn't really say what we're supposed to loose now, does he? But he just says, if you don't like sickness, well, just bind it. Well, he's talking about Matthew chapter 18. And we discussed Matthew chapter 18 in the previous session. Matthew chapter 18 deals with church discipline. And Jesus is talking about how you bring a sinning Christian to repentance. And you follow the steps. Won't go through all of it again, but you follow the steps of church discipline. You go to the person individually. If he does not listen to you, you take one or two more with you. If he does not listen to them, then you tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen to the church, then you put him outside of the church. And then Jesus follows that up by saying, whatever you bind on earth... And you have to be careful with the Greek tense here. It's not whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. The proper Greek tense, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. And what Jesus is saying is, is that if, if you go to the sinning person and he repents of his sin then you loose him. Then he's, he's forgiven. It's done. You don't talk about it anymore. He's been freed. He's been forgiven, loosed of the sin. If he does not repent, he shows himself to be an unbeliever, and you put him outside of the church. You kick him out of the church for the health of the local body and for this person's own well-being. You put him outside of the church. In other words, he is still bound. He's still bound in his sin because he hasn't repented. And he proves himself to be an unbeliever, so he's lost. And that's what Jesus is saying. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound. It, he's saying it's already been bound. And if, if you loose him on earth because he has for, been forgiven, he's repented, he's been forgiven, has already been loosed in heaven. It's not that we pronounce something and then heaven follows suit. No, Jesus is saying if you follow these directives, whatever conclusion to which you come, heaven agrees with you. You can have 100% confidence that heaven agrees with the action that is taken. Why? Because you followed the directives that Jesus gives in Matthew chapter 18. This has absolutely nothing to do with physical healing. You can take verses of Scripture out of their context, and you can make the Bible say just about whatever you want it to say. It's got nothing to do with healing. It's got everything to do with church discipline. Now, foundational to our discussion tonight is this. Is physical healing provided for in the atonement? The atonement is the word that we give to the work that Jesus did for us on the cross. And uh, sadly, we saw earlier today that the prosperity preachers do not believe that Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. They believe he paid for our sins in hell. We looked at that earlier. But they all appeal to Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. Let me show you this video clip from Andrew Womack. Jesus placed your and my sickness and diseases, infirmities, upon Jesus, and he bore them 2,000 years ago. If he already paid for your healing, how can you doubt that you are healed? So if Jesus paid for our healing, then how can we doubt that we are healed? Because healing is provided for in the atonement. And they all appeal to Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 and 5. It says this, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And look at these two words that I have here, that I have highlighted here, griefs and sorrows. Another way to render these two words is as sickness and pain, respectively. These two words in Hebrew do have multiple possible renderings. So if you take the sickness and pain renderings, then Jesus bore our sickness, carried our pain, because Jesus bore our sickness Jesus carried our pain, we should not have to. That's the logic. Well, how do you know which rendering is correct? Is it griefs or sickness? Is it sorrows or is it pain? Well, you know which rendering is correct by the context of the passage. So let's look at the context of the passage. It becomes very clear simply by looking at the very next verse, 
verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So very clearly, the primary context of Isaiah 53 is not physical healing. It's spiritual healing, not healing from sickness and disease, healing from sin. We see that from these two words, transgressions and iniquities. In fact, read Isaiah chapter 53. Read the whole chapter. Read chapter 52. Chapter 53, the whole context is talking about sin, transgression, iniquity. He bore the sins of many. It, 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 the whole thing is talking about sin, not sickness and disease, not cancer and arthritis. So, what is the answer to our question? Is physical healing provided for in the atonement? I might surprise you with the answer. Yes. Yes, it absolutely is. Physical healing is provided for in the atonement. Dear friends, the reason that I have cerebral palsy, the reason that I walk on crutches, is a result of sin. Not my personal sin, but the sin of Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve ate of that fruit, whatever it was, we don't know that it was an apple, you know, but whatever the fruit was, when they ate of that fruit, sickness and disease entered the world, and so did death, physical, physical and spiritual death. And so, yes, the reason I'm crippled is a result of sin. The reason many of you are wearing eyeglasses tonight, that's a result of sin. Not your personal sin, but the sin of Adam and Eve. Next time you catch a cold, you can blame Adam and Eve for that. It's just one of the consequences of living in a fallen world. And so when Jesus came and he died on the cross, he paid for our sins. He also paid for all of the consequences of those sins, one of which is sickness and disease. So yes, physical healing is provided for in the atonement. But here's where the prosperity preachers get it very, very wrong. Not all of the benefits of the atonement are promised to be fully realized this side of heaven. Okay? Not all the benefits of the atonement are promised to be fully realized this side of heaven. Some of the benefits of Jesus' atonement we will not realize until the other side of heaven. And healing from sickness and disease is one of those benefits. To give you another example of this, a glorified body is also provided for in the atonement. Raise your hand if you have your glorified body. Nobody here? No, you don't. <laughs> so you do. Nobody's got their glorified body? Why not? It's provided for in the atonement. It's not promised to be realized here. Dear friends, when we die and go to heaven... For all of us who are in Christ, we've been made new creatures in Christ. We've trusted Christ as Savior and Lord. When we die and go to heaven, we're not going to take our sickness and disease with us. No more cerebral palsy, no more cancer, no more arthritis, no more muscular dystrophy, no more multiple sclerosis, none of these things. Why? Because our healing has been provided for, bought and paid for with the blood, death, death, in bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But dear ones, if we really stop and think about it, I'm really not even sure it's even going to cross our minds that we no longer have our sickness and disease. I really don't think we're even going to give it a second thought. So many times we have such an earthly view of heaven. And so oftentimes we, we hear heaven described as this great big family reunion. You know, we'll be reunited with grandma and grandpa. And, and we'll walk on streets of gold. And will we? Yes. Yeah. 
We will be reunited with our loved ones, provided that they were in Christ when they preceded us in death. If they were in Christ, yes, we will be reunited with them. But that's not the joy of heaven. Dear ones, the joy of heaven is Christ. Knowing Christ, His person, He is the joy and the glory of heaven. He is who makes heaven heaven. We will be able to worship Christ fully, serve Him forever, enjoy Him forever, for all of eternity. We will be in the presence of the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who spoke the universe into existence, the one who died for us. He is the joy and the glory of heaven. All of these other things, secondary at best. We're going to have better things to think about, dear ones. He is what makes heaven heaven. Is Jesus enough for you? You know, you talk to a lot of people. What are you looking forward to about heaven? Or what? They think, oh, well, I'm not going to be... I'm not going to have my crutches anymore. I'm not going to have my cane anymore. I'm going to... I would say your view of heaven is far too small. Your view of God is far too small. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. What of the biblical record? Can we look through the Bible and find examples of people who loved the Lord, were faithful servants of His, and yet did not walk in perfect health? Yes. Trophimus was left sick at Miletus. Epaphroditus was sick to the point of death. The Apostle Paul encouraged Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach and his frequent ailments. Now, I find this interesting. Notice that when the Apostle Paul heard about Timothy's stomach problems and his frequent ailments, Paul did not write to Timothy and say, oh, Timothy, go see a faith healer. Go see a faith healer. Oh, and, and be sure you sow a seed into his ministry. Give him some money. Sow a seed so you can reap a harvest. Take a little wine for your stomach and your frequent ailments. Now, I find this interesting on yet another level. The Apostle Paul wrote this to Timothy about the year A.D. 64. About the year A.D. 64. Back up 10 years to the year A.D. 54. What was going on in the year A.D. 54? Extraordinary miracles of healing were going on. Acts chapter 19 was going on. Miracles so extraordinary that even handkerchiefs and aprons were being taken from the Apostle Paul, delivered to sick people, and God was healing the sick at distances remotely through the agents of these handkerchiefs and aprons. Acts chapter 19. A.D. 54. Ten years later, A.D. 64. No handkerchiefs and aprons going forth from the Apostle Paul. What changed? Could it be? It's just a possibility. This is not an issue of whether you know, we have fellowship in Christ or anything like that. But it's interesting, I think, that somewhere in that ten-year span something appears to have changed, could it be that the apostolic gift of healing had already begun to fade away, had already begun to pass out of operation? Two years later, the Apostle Paul is with Trophimus, and he left him sick. Paul was with him. He was with him, and he left him sick. He didn't heal him. Paul had healed many others earlier, but he didn't heal Timothy. He didn't heal Trophimus. And Paul himself... Paul himself, this is interesting, Galatians chapter 4. Paul himself writes, verse 13, But you know that it was because of a bodily illness 
that I preached the gospel to you the first time, and that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition you did not despise nor loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus himself. The Apostle Paul himself had some kind of a bodily illness. We don't know what it was. Bad eyesight, very good evidence from Scripture that Paul had very bad eyesight. Maybe among other things, maybe that was just one of many ailments that he had. But here's the man who wrote roughly half of the New Testament. He had a bodily illness. Job. Job is the 800-pound theological gorilla sitting in the living room of the prosperity preachers, none of whom want to admit is there. Job's a problem for the faith preachers. Because here you have a man who is upright and righteous, had done nothing wrong. Doesn't mean he was sinless, but he had done nothing really wrong, uh, deserving of all the calamities that fell upon him. And yet, God allowed Satan to come and to strike from Job everything that he had. His possessions destroyed. His family dead. His own health deteriorated. Job suffered like I would dare say none of us could even imagine. Job's a problem for the faith preachers. So what do they do with Job? It's hard to ignore an entire book out of the Bible. So you know what they do to Job? They turn the tables on Job. And they say the reason these calamities fell upon Job, they were all results of his negative confessions. Job spoke negative words, and he brought all of these calamities upon himself. It was all Job's fault, you see. Job tapped into the dark side of the force. And he brought all these calamities upon himself. That's new thought. That's, that's cultic. Completely misses the point of the book of Job. Misses it entirely. Dear friends, do you know what the point of the book of Job is? The sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. God can do whatever he wants to do. And sometimes that means making us sick. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God makes people sick? Now, if you tell that to a, a word of faith, New Apostolic Reformation kind of person, that God makes people sick, they'll probably faint right on the spot. They, they, they won't even know how to process that. They'll think you're crazy. What, what? No, he doesn't. God doesn't make people sick. No? Hmm. Well, if he doesn't, then somebody needs to inform God because he seems to think that he does. Exodus chapter 4, verse 11. The Lord said to Moses, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him dumb or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Friends, that's God talking there. I don't know how you get around that. That's God talking. Sometimes God makes people sick. Now, sometimes we make ourselves sick, don't we? I mean, if we lay around all day long on the couch and we eat nothing but, uh, I don't know if you have these in Norway, but some of the American junk food, we have ding-dongs and Twinkies and, and little Debbie Fudge cream cakes. You know, if you eat nothing but junk food all day and, and you go through three or four packs of cigarettes every day, uh, don't be surprised if you have some health problems. Only or Nagati every day. <laughs> Don't be surprised if you have some health problems. Sometimes we make ourselves sick. Sometimes people get sick just because people get sick. We live in a fallen world and people just get sick. But sometimes God makes people sick. Why does he do that? Just to watch somebody suffer? No, no. But sometimes God makes people sick to sanctify them, to, the, to grow them in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Christ, and, but also ultimately to glorify himself, to glorify himself. And everything that God does ultimately is about his glory. I want to show you a picture of a man I met in Long Island, New York. His name is Rich. Rich was born able-bodied, nothing wrong with Rich at all. 
And Rich got saved when he was 19 years old. And just a few years after that, in his early 20s, when he was 23, I think, Rich had a motorcycle accident, and it left him completely paralyzed. No use of his legs at all, very, very limited use of his arms. And Rich can do nothing for himself physically, nothing for himself. He lives with his brother and his sister-in-law, neither of whom are believers, neither of whom are Christians. But every Sunday morning, Rich asks his brother and sister-in-law to get him up out of bed. And so they get him up out of bed on Sunday mornings. They bathe him and they dress him. And they put him in his electric wheelchair. And Rich drives his electric wheelchair five miles one way to church every single Sunday. And he never misses even when it's raining, they put a poncho over him, a piece of plastic. They put a poncho over him to keep him dry and the electronics of his wheelchair dry so his wheelchair doesn't short out. And he drives his electric wheelchair five miles one way to church in the rain. And the only thing that will keep Rich from going to church is if it's snowing. And his wheelchair just won't go in the snow. Other than that, he's there. The pastor of the church told me, he said, Rich is the most faithful church member I've got. Rich has bumper stickers on the back of his wheelchair with scripture verses on them. He is quite literally a rolling testimony for Christ. <laughs> Friends, God is glorified in that. God is glorified in that. When a lost world sees him every Sunday morning, they see this man every Sunday morning five miles to church, and he's, you talk to him, he's just full of joy, he loves the Lord, he's a, just a pleasure to be around. God's glorified in that. And yet we've got prosperity preachers saying that you can have your best life now. Joel Osteen talks about in his book, he's talking about how one day he and his wife Victoria were looking for a good parking spot at the mall. But all the good parking spots were taken, but they just kept believing God for a good parking spot. And so they just kept driving around, and so they, they're coming down the aisle of cars, and wouldn't you know it, the car in the very front spot backed away and drove off just in time for Joel and Victoria to get in and get, get that good parking spot up front. And Joel Osteen said, friends, that's the favor of God. Really? That's your idea of the favor of God? Tell that to Rich. Tell that to our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who right now are being persecuted for their faith in Christ. Tell that to our brothers and sisters in Christ in Syria, in Iran, in Iraq, where being a Christian right now will mean you lose your head, literally. Tell that to the pastor in Iran right now, Syed Abedini, who has a wife and two children back in the United States, and he is languishing in a hellhole of a prison in Iran simply because he's a Christian and he will not renounce his faith in Christ. Tell him that the favor of God is getting a good parking spot at the mall in the United States of America. Are you kidding me? The prosperity preachers have no understanding of the gospel. None. None. They have trusted a different Jesus with a different gospel. Dear friends, sometimes God is most glorified in us when we suffer, when we are persecuted, when we are sick. And yet through the suffering, through the persecution, through the sickness, we remain faithful to Christ. Is it always easy? No, it's not. But when we keep our eyes on Christ and we glorify Him, when things are tough, 
when the persecution does come, when the sickness does come, God is glorified in that. God is glorified in that. Elisha had a double portion anointing of the great prophet Elijah, and yet we read in 2 Kings chapter 13 that Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. Dear friends, it is a matter of biblical record that not everyone who loved the Lord and served him faithfully walked in perfect divine health. It's not a matter of opinion. It's not up for debate. It's simply a matter of biblical record. Does God still heal people today? Yes. Yes, he does. Is he always healing people today? No, he's not. He wasn't doing it in the days of the Bible, and he's not doing it today either. A lot of people mistakenly believe about me, oh, Justin teaches that God doesn't heal people today. I don't teach that. I've never taught that. I do believe God heals people today. I just don't think he's doing it through any of these false teachers. And he's not doing it through someone who says, send me money and God will give you a miracle. These are charlatans. These are wolves. These are men who are opposed to Christ, who care nothing but for themselves, who fill their own bellies, care nothing about themselves. For nothing but themselves. Yes, God heals people today, but only when it is His sovereign will to do so. Only when it is His sovereign will to do so. And He doesn't need anybody to somehow activate healing. If God wants to heal you, He will just do it. Nothing wrong with praying for healing. Nothing wrong with praying for healing. Do I pray for people to be healed? Sometimes. But you know what? Rather than spending so much time for somebody to be healed, you know, growing up as a Southern Baptist, we would go to church. We would have uh, Wednesday night prayer meetings, and and they would read the list of prayer requests. And if you've ever been to a church service and they read off prayer requests, Nine out of ten, and I would say probably more like 19 out of 20, almost all the prayer requests, somebody's sick, somebody has cancer, somebody broke their leg. You know, we need to pray for them. We need to, I'm not, don't hear me wrong, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with praying for healing at all. Pray for healing, pray for your friend to be healed, your family member to be healed, that's fine. But maybe rather than spending so much time praying for physical healing, maybe we should spend a little bit more time praying for things like this. God, sanctify me in this. Use this trial in my life to grow me in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. In whatever you do with me, May I be faithful to you and may I give you the praise and give you the glory, whether you heal me or whether you don't. Grow me, sanctify me. Maybe we should spend a little bit more time praying for things like that. We have such a shallow, shallow view of the gospel, shallow view of what it means to be a Christian. According to the prosperity preachers, are there any requirements to receive your healing? If you listen to the prosperity preachers, yep, one of the requirements you must meet if you want to be healed, show me the money. You better sow that seed. Watch this from Joyce Meyer. Do I believe that God wants to bless us? Yes. But when you go to the conferences, you ask people to give money. So sure. You say, do it cheerfully. Yep. Because. Because the Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. See, giving 
is a major part of the whole Christian doctrine. But do you believe that if someone gives money to the ministry, right. that more will come back to them? Yes. Absolutely. I think that's what they mean by prosperity yes. gospel. No, but you worry at all that, that sometimes your message will be heard by someone in the most dire circumstances. This is sort of roulette wheel, a sort of gamble with God. Okay, well, I can't pay the rent, but I'll give it to Joyce and we'll see what happens. Do you worry at all that well, that happens? I, I totally know. I don't worry about that. Well, no, she totally doesn't worry about that. Well, she should. I'm sure she doesn't worry about it, but she should. Because all around the world right now, right now, there are people watching quote unquote Christian television and they are at home and they're sick. They have a sick child. They have a sick spouse and they are desperate. And so what do they do? They go and they get their checkbook, they pull out their credit card, and they send in money that most of them do not even have. They send their, their money into these multi-millionaires flying on private jets living in palatial mansions. I'm sure Joyce Meyer doesn't worry about it, but she ought to. Watch this video clip from Rod Parsley. Rod Parsley is pastor in Columbus, Ohio. Rod Parsley, context of this video is he is raising money for his ministry. Now, Rod Parsley, have you ever noticed if you've watched these people, sometimes they get real specific with the dollar amount. I want you to sow a, a seed of, in this example, $54.17. Rod Parsley wants you to sow $54.17 into his ministry. Well, why $54.17? <laughs> well, based off of Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17, of course. Didn't know that. Watch this from Rod Parsley. There's a battle raging, and it's raging right now. A fierce, all-out attack against you, against everything of great value in your life. But my dear, dear friend, your commander-in-chief has full supremacy, absolute authority, and he's decreed and declared that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. On this broadcast, you're about to discover how to receive for yourself his miraculous anointing of provision and protection. Stay right where you are. I'm Rod Parsley. And I'm going to take you at your word. I'm going to stand up in faith and I'm going to sow an Isaiah 54, 17 seed of $54.17. Let's go to the phone. Do it right now. Go to the phone. Right now. This is a moment of faith that may never, ever, ever be repeated again. But God is saying, if you're hearing this word, take hold of it. Seize this moment. Claim this word right now as your own word and say, God, that's me. That's my family. That's my business. That's my ministry. That's my church. God, those are my children. That's my marriage. So I feel the adversary releasing his stranglehold. Are you going to your phone? $54.17 says, are you going to your phone right now? Are you going to your phone? Are you going to your phone right now? You know why they want you to hurry up and go to your phone? There's, a, ooh, there, ooh, there's an anointing here. It, it, you need to go to your phone right now. If you miss this anointing, it may never come again. Hurry up. Go to that phone. Sow your seat. You know why they want you to hurry up and go to your phone? Because they know if you actually stop and think a little bit, you might not go to your phone. And you might not sow your $54.17 seed into Rod Parsley's ministry. Well, now let's be fair to Rod Parsley. Let's look at this. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. Wow. Well, it does say that, doesn't it? And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. Huh, well. Well, it does say that, doesn't it? No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. A couple of things to be said about this. Dear friends, number one, there is nothing inspired about 5417. That's just the chapter divisions and the verse numbers. 
Nothing inspired about that. Man put those in there just to help us look things up in the Bible a little bit more easily. So the content is inspired, but the chapter divisions and the verse numbers aren't. So, so that, it's meaningless, 5417, meaningless. But what about this? It says, no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. Is that true? Because it does seem to say that this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Well, aren't we servants of the Lord? Yes. So is it true that no weapon that is formed against us will prosper? Is that true? Well, it kind of depends. Uh, it is true, but not necessarily true here and now. Not necessarily be to, to be realized here and now. It is true in the grand scheme of things that when God brings everything to their appointed end in the eschaton, in the last days, it is true that no weapon that is formed against God or His people will prosper. That is true. But that's not necessarily to be realized here. It seems to me that the weapon, the sword, that was formed in the blacksmith shop that lopped off the head of the Apostle Paul, that weapon seemed to prosper, didn't it? The nails that affixed Peter to the cross upside down, those, those weapons seemed to prosper. The whip that beat our Lord, that, that weapon seemed to prosper. So it's kind of like physical healing. Is it promised? Yes. Is it, supposed to, is it guaranteed to be realized here? No. So this really doesn't fit, does it? No, it doesn't. But 5417, now what's interesting about this is verse 17 is the last verse of Isaiah chapter 54. It's the last verse in Isaiah 54. Now why didn't he go just one more verse? You know, uh, and so a 55 verse 1 seed. You know, that would, that would be 84 more cents per sower into his ministry. You know, that, that would get him more money if he just went one more verse. Well, you know why he didn't go one more verse? I'll show you why he didn't go one more verse. Here it is. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters. You who have no money, come. Buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. That's why he didn't want you to look at the next verse. Because it totally obliterates everything he was just saying. He's a charlatan. He is a greasy snake oil salesman. My sincere apologies to all greasy snake oil salesmen for comparing them to somebody like Rod Parsley. He's a wolf. If you have your Bibles, look at Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. This is account, an account with which undoubtedly we are probably all familiar. This is the widow's might. Now, I don't mind telling you that I have never really understood this story. The story of the widow, the widow's might, it's never made sense to me. I don't know about you. It's never really made sense to me. Well, let's look at this. Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. And he, Jesus, looked up, and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. For they all out of their surplus put into the offering. But she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. And that's it. That's all we know about her. Now the way we have most often heard this passage taught is the widow should be our model in giving. We should all give like the widow gave. Now, dear friends, let's keep in mind, this widow didn't give most of what she had. She gave everything. Raise your hand if you have done what the widow did. Has anybody in here done that? I've never seen anybody raise their hand. You know what? I can't raise my hand either. I haven't done this. I don't know anybody who has. And you know what? If she is our model in giving, if we're supposed to give like she gave, you know what? We've all blown it. We have blown it. I don't know anybody who's ever done this. 
Now, think about this too. She was a widow. She was a widow living, living 2,000 years ago in the Roman Empire, and as a widow, she had no means of support. She gave everything she had, every cent. And then she left there completely broke, completely destitute. Now, the Bible doesn't say this. It's just an educated guess. Nothing more, just an educated guess. In all likelihood, with no means of support and zero money, it probably wasn't very long after this that this widow died. Educated guess. But we're taught by most, oh, well, well the widow gave so selflessly. Uh, she gave out of the abundance of her heart. Did she? I don't read that in the Bible. Jesus doesn't say anything about why she gave. He just makes an observation. A very simple, straightforward, short observation. She gave more than all of them because she gave out of her poverty. Well, Jesus was pleased with this, right? Doesn't say that in my Bible. Jesus doesn't commend her. He doesn't say that this was a good thing that she did. And let's think about it. Is this what Jesus expects of poor widows today? Does Jesus expect widows to give every cent that they have to the church? No. No. The Bible says a lot about how we are to care for the poor and the sick and the widows. So what's going on here? Well, let's keep this in mind. Let's ask this question. To what was she giving? Was she giving to, uh, you know, whatever, First Baptist Church of Jerusalem? Was she giving to Grace Community Church of Jerusalem? No. She was giving to the synagogue. She was giving to a corrupt religious system. And she gave everything she had. This was Wednesday before the Friday that Jesus was crucified. She gave everything she had to the same religious system that in two days was going to nail Jesus to a tree. That's what she was giving to. She gave to a religious system that was corrupt from top to bottom. And she gave it all. I don't think this pleased Jesus at all. I think it angered him. He never commends her. Now, for context, look up a few verses. Remember, the chapter division is not inspired here. Look at verse 45, chapter 20. And while all the people were listening, he said to the disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes. They love respectful greetings in the marketplaces, chief seats in the synagogues, and places of honor at banquets. And then look at verse 47. Who do what? Who devour widows' homes. And for appearance's sake, offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. And what's the very next thing he sees? He sees a poor widow whose home had been devoured. You see how important context is. This widow was being exploited. This widow was being told, if you want the blessings of God, send in your money. Give us your money. It's what the Catholic Church has taught for almost its entire existence. You want blessings? Pay your penance. Put in your offering. You want to get your grandmother out of purgatory? Give us money. In the prosperity preachers today, you want healing? Send me your money. Sow a seed so you can reap a harvest. You need to get out of debt? Give me money. And you know where these prosperity preachers get a lot of their money? You know how they afford to live in 35,000 square foot Homes, you know how they afford to have five private airplanes like Jesse Duplantis has got and like Kenneth Copeland has got? And recently, Creflo Dollar made news because he's wanting to raise $65 million for a private jet. 
You know where they get this money? A lot of it comes from the poor and the sick and the desperate and the widows, little old ladies at home who tragically, their only church is their television. In light of what we've just talked about, watch this video clip from Mike Murdoch. Mike Murdoch, watch this. There is a widow who is watching Daystar, watching us right now. And you're sitting there and your thoughts are, wow, I wish I was young again and I wish I had a business, but I'm on a fixed income. And I don't know where I would get the $58. That's what makes it faith. That's what makes it faith actually targets widows. I see a poor widow who's watching me right now. You, low down, wolf. When these people die, when Mike Murdoch dies, when Rod Parsley dies, when all these pro prosperity preachers die, unless God grants them their penance, they will bust hell wide open. You know, and oftentimes we think of the really bad guys as being Hitler and Pol Pot and Mussolini and Saddam Hussein. Those are the really bad guys that'll really have it bad in hell. I would submit to you that, that these people that we think are just so evil, they will have it easy, comparatively speaking, to what these people will have. Because the deepest, darkest, hottest part of hell will be reserved for those people who had the most exposure to the truth and yet rejected it and yet used it for personal financial gain. It's not like these people don't have exposure to the truth. They all have Bibles. They all read from them. They all supposedly preach it. And yet they distort the gospel and they exploit the poor and the sick and the desperate and the widows, dear friends. It does not get any worse than that. It does not get any worse than that. Other requirements to be healed, according to the prosperity preachers, if you want to be healed, well, your heart must be right with God. You must have a right heart. Watch this from John Hagee. That's what that means. Let me tell you, sickness comes from the devil. And when you walk into a hospital room and your friend is there, a member of your family is there, you have the power to say, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke that disease. And the God of heaven will heal that disease when you are right with God in heaven. So John Hagee says that if you have a friend or family member in a hospital room, you can just go into that hospital room and as long as you're right with God, you can command that sickness to leave. Well, I find that very interesting because this was aired in March of 2010. You know where John Hagee was about a year and a half before this in October of 2008? John Hagee was flat on his back on an operating table with his chest cracked open. And they were doing quadruple bypass surgery on John Hagee. Now, why didn't he just command his arteries to clear up? Would have saved himself an awful lot of time and heartache, pardon the pun. I take no joy that John Hagee had open heart surgery. I take no joy in that. But I do find it interesting that what the faith preachers preach doesn't work for them. So what was wrong with his walk with the Lord? Interesting. Why are they sick? Essek W. Kenyon, the grandfather of this movement, died from a tumor. Kenneth Hagin, father of the modern Word of Faith movement, died from heart disease. Oral Roberts, one of the leading uh, early faith healers, died from heart disease. Fred Price's wife, treated for cancer. Jan Crouch, cancer, gallbladder surgery. Nora Lamb, this is the faith healer I went to see when I was a teenager. 
She had a massive stroke in 2003 and died early the next year. Friends of faith healers get sick just like us common folk do. And if what they preach doesn't work for them, that ought to be a clue to them. There just might be something wrong with what they're preaching. This is an interesting photograph I came across. Jesse Duplantis, Benny Hinn, and John Hakey. Now, Benny Hinn, look at the man in the middle. He's the world's most famous faith healer, healing evangelist. What's Benny, what, is, what has Benny Hinn got on his face? Oh, eyeglasses. Mr. Miracle himself has to wear eyeglasses. Friends, never trust a faith healer who wears eyeglasses. You know, all these prosperity people, Word of Faith, NAR, they say it's always God's will to be healed because we have been completely delivered from all of the effects of the curse. You know, sickness and disease is one of the effects of the curse. And they say, when you become a Christian, you're delivered from all of that. Really? If somebody ever tells you that it's always God's will to be healed because we've been delivered from the effects of the curse, of the fall, ask them this question. Have you stopped aging? Because the reason we age is the same reason we get sick. Think about it. The reason we cannot physically do at age 80 what we could do when we were 20 is because we live in a fallen world. And you know what? Day by day, the fall is taking its toll on us. So the next time somebody tells you, well, it's always God's will to be healed because we've been delivered from the curse, uh, ask them, okay, have you stopped aging? Take out a picture of yourself from 10 years ago. Let's take a look. And until people stop aging, these Word of Faith preachers stop aging, they've got nothing to say to us. By the way, just a couple weeks ago, Benny Hinn, he was admitted to the intensive care unit, heart problems. According to the faith preachers, are you not healed? Well, if you're not healed, it's probably because you just don't have enough faith. Watch this from Benny Hinn. My friend, hear this well. The reason people lose their healing is because they begin questioning if God really did it. We receive it by faith. We keep it by faith. Say by faith. Kind and touched his garment. Now, before she touched, verse 1 to 8 says, For she said, For she said, For she said. Say that with me. In other words, she knew. She knew that she knew that she knew she's going to get a miracle. First key, she heard. Second key, she came. Third key, she knew. When you know, you're on the way. But if you sit there and say, I'm not sure, you just lost it. What does laying your hands on a human have to do with healing? Well, really nothing. We touch people all the time, they're still sick. What he's looking for is permission. The power to heal is always present. But having permission to heal, is held up by humanity and their lack of faith. <laughs> Hallelujah. Having permission to heal is held up by humanity and their lack of faith. So if you're not healed, it's because you just don't have enough faith. Is faith required for us to receive physical healing from God? Well, dear friends, let me put it in these terms. If you're here tonight and you know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, if you've been born again, don't let anybody tell you that you don't have enough faith to be healed. Because if you have been saved, if you have been granted enough faith to be saved, you have certainly got enough faith to be healed. Because being saved is by far the greatest miracle. If God were to heal me right now of my cerebral palsy and I were to drop my crutches never to pick them up again, it would be a pretty incredible miracle. 
But that miracle would pale in comparison to what God did for me when he saved me from my sins, when he made me alive in Christ. That is the greatest miracle of all. If you know Jesus as Savior and Lord, don't let anybody ever tell you you don't have enough faith to be healed. If you've been granted enough faith to be saved, you've certainly got enough faith to be healed. According to the prosperity preachers, are you not healed? Well, it's probably because you're just not saved. If you're sick, you're probably not even a Christian. Watch this from Benny Hinn. Now, ladies and gentlemen, hear this very clearly, please, and never forget. It's as easy to get healed as it is to get forgiven. It's as easy to receive physical healing as it is to receive forgiveness for sin. It's just as easy to get healed. Healing is as easy as salvation. not complicate what is simple say with me it's as easy to get healed as it is to get forgiven healing should never be separate from salvation healing should never be separate from salvation and I invite you just for a minute to put yourself in the shoes of someone who is there and they are sick. They do have cancer. They do have a sick child. And they hear that. And when the show is over, they leave with a, in the same wheelchair, with the same cancer, with the same sick child. Now not only do they have their illness with which to deal, now they also have to worry that they're not even saved just because they're sick just because they're sick. One day, these false teachers will have to stand before a holy God and they will have to give an account for what they are doing to the poor, to the sick, to the desperate, to the widows, and they will have to give an account for what they are doing to the gospel of Christ. What does James say? Let not many of you desire to be teachers, my brethren, knowing that we will incur a stricter judgment. These prosperity preachers should be terrified at what awaits them. You're not saved just because you're sick. We have one final video clip, and before I show it, I just want to set it up for you quickly. Uh, this clip is going to begin with a few short clips of Gloria Copeland. I want you to notice her arrogance. I want you to notice her callousness. I want you to notice how she all but just makes fun of and ridicules sick people. I mean, she just mocks them. And then the clip is going to transition to a man named Garwin Dobbins, G-A-R-W-I-N, Garwin Dobbins. And Garwin Dobbins suffers from a very, very rare disease that uh, probably nobody in this room could even imagine, myself included. And yet through incomprehensible pain and suffering, Garwin Dobbins loves the Lord and he seeks to serve him and, and, and glorify him in the midst of his suffering. I want you to notice the contrast between a wolf and a real child of God. That's a tradition, that God is glorified when you're sick. Well, now, if you'll just think about it a minute, it would be very difficult for God to be glorified through you when you're sick. It is nonsense to say that sickness and disease works for good. It's a slander to talk evil about God. When He is totally good to say that it's God's will for you to be sick, or He's the one that made you sick, that is pitiful. Or he's doing that to teach you something. You don't hear those things as much as you used to, I don't guess. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't go where you could hear them, so I don't know. You probably, they're still out there, I imagine.
But if it was true that you learned through pain and suffering, we could just knock every little kid in the head before he went to school every morning <laughs> and see how he did that day. He'd come dragging in, his eyes rolling around, and, well, tell me what you learned today. I didn't learn anything. My head just hurt me all day long. That's about how stupid that is. So that God puts, here's the, here's the doctrine that, that, uh, that people get hung up on. God gets glory from sickness and disease. Now that, is, that just sounds so ridiculous to me now. I've heard the truth for so long. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. So traditional doctrine takes that. Verse 28 doesn't look what's around it or what's behind it. And they say, well, you know, you know, all things work together for good. Here, you've just had a car wreck, your leg's broken, your head's all bandaged up, and somebody comes on with the, in with the comforting words, you know, all things work together for those that love God. And you say, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. I should have thought of that. <laughs> Does that make any sense at all? No. It is not Bible that God gets glory from your sickness and disease. And one of them is a gentleman named Garwin Dobbins. And he's here. Would you all welcome Garwin right here? Garwin Dobbins. Garwin, we love you. And this season wouldn't be appropriate for us to tell of the goodness of the Lord if, if you weren't here helping us. Garwin, I want you to talk right now, Mike. Tell us, let me see if I can get this disease right, because it's big, long, a lot of vowels and consonants. Myositis mm -hmm. esophagans yes. progressiva. Right. Did got, I get all that right? You got it. There's only how many people in the world ever had this? As of right now, there's supposed to be 350 known cases. All right. Tell us what this disease actually does just in a short amount of time, what it does to the person. It makes your muscle turn to bone. And it, uh, when it starts, it feels like two different people is twisting the inner core of your bone and uh, putting it over an open flame. You know what's, uh, uh, what I admire about you so much is with this debilitating disease that you have is your spirit you have the spirit of a champion and in this uh, autumn time of thanksgiving is it possible to have something like this in your life and yet remain thankful oh yes tell us how, how are you thankful in times like these i'm very thankful for for life for health for eyes when i see <clears throat> that there's people that's worse off than myself. There's people that don't have legs, don't have ears, don't have a healthy mind, or cannot have a sense of smell. And when I look about and see the color that God has spangled the sky with in the, in the rainbow, and when he put the stars in the sky, I know that he cares for me. Yeah. Now you sing a song that we're going to do right now. If the Lord doesn't choose to heal you on this earth, there will be a time shortly when you will be healed. In your mind, what do you see yourself doing when this body has been exchanged for your new body? What do you see yourself doing? If we're going to run on streets of gold and uh, number one person I want to meet is David because he has been a strength to me over the years and uh, I want to be as close to him like him in praise and worship wow isn't that incredible that he would uh you know, a lot of people might be bitter. 
or angry at God, and yet he remains a person of praise. There's never been anybody I've ever met that is more encouraging than Garwin. Garwin, you sing a song called I Can Only Imagine. Mm -hmm. Can we help you? Yes. But you just want to do this by yourself? No, you know, I want you to. Okay, all right. Let's, uh, on. let's uh, stand you up here. Undo his, undo his seat belt. Watch for the airbags and all the... Here we go. I can only imagine. salvation.
Garwin no longer has to imagine. Garwin's now with the Lord. His faith now made sight. As we close, um, I just want to close with the gospel. Never take it for granted that everybody at a conference is, um, is a Christian. I want to close with the gospel. Has, has there been a time in your life when you have been convicted by God's Holy Spirit that you are a sinner, that you have broken God's laws? All of us have told lies, every one of us. There's not a person in here who hasn't lied. We are liars. Most of us have stolen something, that, taken something that doesn't belong to us. We're thieves. We are blasphemers. We have blasphemed God's name in word, in deed. We've committed adultery. Oh, I'm not even married. Well, Jesus says if you look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery already in your heart. If you've ever looked at another person with lust, you're an adulterer. Go through the Ten Commandments, dear ones. We have all broken God's laws hundreds, thousands, thousands of times. And just like when we break laws here on earth, there's a penalty to be paid, how much more so when we break the laws of the eternal God? But when we sin against God, when we break His laws, the punishment of that sin is also eternal. And if we die in our sins, we will very rightly and very justly go to a very real place that the Bible calls hell. And we will be there for all of eternity. And it will never end. The full, undiluted fury of God's wrath will be poured out for all of eternity. Do you know the most terrifying thing about hell is God? Because He's there. He's there. We often think of hell as just being separated from God. Eternally, if you die in your sins, you'll, you'll be eternally separated from God. That's not entirely true. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 and 10, talks about those, the wicked who go to the lake of fire and it says they will be tormented day and night in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. People in hell are separated from God relationally. There's no relationship there. There's no love exchange there. There's no comfort from God there. But judicially, People are in the presence of God, and they'll endure His wrath for all of eternity, and that's what you deserve. That's what I deserve. But there is good news, and the good news of the gospel is this, is that God loves you. God demonstrated His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who lived on this earth a perfect life, he never broke any of the laws of God. And Jesus willingly laid down his life on the cross. His life was not taken. He gave it. He willingly laid down his life on the cross. And he bore the wrath of God so that you and I would not have to. And on the third day, he was bodily raised from the dead. And he proved himself to be who he said he was, God in human flesh. And the only way to have the wrath of God removed is to repent of sins, turn from sins, and place your trust in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And a lot of people ask, well, how do I repent? And I think there's a really big misunderstanding about repentance among most professing Christians. And people have this idea of repentance. Well, I just will myself to be a better person. I, I will myself to turn away from certain sins. But that's not what repentance is. 
Genuine repentance is granted by God. God grants repentance. 2 Timothy chapter 2, Acts chapter 5, verses 30 and 31, Acts chapter 11, verse 17, all speak of God granting repentance. And so many people are trying to do it on their own. They just try to will themselves to turn away from certain sins. But that's not repentance. The cessation of certain sins, stopping certain sins in and of itself, is not repentance. I'll give you an illustration. Let's take a man and let's ascribe to this man two easily identifiable sins. Let's say that this man, this theoretical man, is a, is a pathological liar. He lies all the time. And let's say he's an alcoholic. He's a drunk. And so let's take this man and we'll fly him out somewhere in the ocean, 100 miles out in the ocean, find some little deserted island somewhere, drop him off, helicopter, put him down on the island, give him a tent, give him some bread, give him some water, and leave him there. Guess what? He stops sinning. He stops lying because he's got nobody to talk to. And guess what? He stops getting drunk because he's got no alcohol. It doesn't mean he's repented. Why? Because his heart has not been changed. His heart has not been changed. If he still, if he still had access to those sins, he would go right back to them. How many of you maybe have just tried to repent on your own, but... If you had access to those sins, and if nobody would find out about it, whew, go right back to them. If that's the case, then you've never repented. Now, don't misunderstand me. I am not talking sinless perfection. Some people out there teach that if you're a Christian, you'll never sin again. Somebody that would teach that does not understand the New Testament. Because you will. Christians do sin. None of us is perfect. But a Christian does not enjoy sin. A Christian does not swim in sin. A Christian does not look for opportunities to sin. If you're truly a Christian, your sin will grieve you. You'll be grieved over it. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 talks about two different kinds of sorrow over sin. There's a worldly sorrow, and then there's a godly sorrow over sin. A worldly sorrow, the Apostle Paul says, leads to death. What is a worldly sorrow? Sorrow that I got caught. A sorrow that is centered around self. What would happen to me if my sin were found out, if my sin were exposed and everybody knew about it, what would happen to me? That's a worldly sorrow, and it leads to death. But there's another kind of sorrow over sin, and that's a godly sorrow. And the Apostle Paul says a godly sorrow leads to genuine repentance. What is a godly sorrow? A godly sorrow is that kind of sorrow that says that understands that our sin first and foremost grieves God. And when we grieve because we have grieved God, because we have grieved His person, and we desire not only a Savior from hell, but we desire a Savior from our sins. When we desire to turn away from sins because we do not want to grieve God, that's a godly sorrow. Do you have that godly sorrow? Do you grieve over your sin because you know that your sin grieves God? It leads to genuine repentance. Ask yourself, do I have that? Has there been a change in my life? I am not asking you if you're a church member. I'm not asking you if you've been baptized. I'm asking you, have you repented of sins and if you're not certain that you have, cry out to the Lord. Ask Him to grant you repentance. Ask Him to forgive you. 
and then place your trust, your faith in the risen Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. You cannot earn your salvation. No amount of good works will please God. Nothing. Our works are as filthy rags. You've got to trust not in what you do, but in what Jesus has done. In what Jesus has done. Cry out to him. Cry out to the Lord. And he'll grant you repentance. He'll grant you salvation. You will pass from death to life. There is salvation in no one else. Let's close in a word of prayer. Our Father, we do we do thank you for we thank you for your gospel. We thank you that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. You came to this earth and you lived among us and willingly laid down your life for us. And you bore God's wrath so that we would not have to. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. And as your gospel has gone out, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would do his work, would, would convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment, would convict of the truth of the gospel. And if there be ones here who do not know Christ or maybe confused about the gospel, Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would draw them, make them alive, uh, take the blinders off and, and regenerate them. Lord, cause them to call after you. Uh, we thank you for your gospel. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. And these things we ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen.